Um, a massive hello to you all. I know I'm not the normal face that you see uh, when it comes to ACA dialogues, um, but I want to welcome you, uh, pass on uh, the apologies of Michelle, who could not make it, unfortunately, today, but want to know that you do have a familiar face uh, in this space today. Uh, Trulu, do you want to just pop on your camera just to say hello so that the people know that it's you and me here this evening? Um, Hi, everyone. I see you there. You, you're glowing. That's good. That's good. We all need to glow, <laughs> especially for this conversation. We need to glow. Hi, everyone. I'm Tulu. Um, I'm also with ACA, and I will be co-facilitating and co-piloting with Gabriel today. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Tulu. Um, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Gabriel. I am I, at the African Climate Alliance, and I like to call myself a space holder and uh, today that's um, and my responsibility is we're going to be space holders and um, it's so important that we acknowledge the importance it's so important that we acknowledge the importance of holding space when it comes to the topic of today and the topic of today playing off of the theme of this month not only the theme but the reality of this month which is mental health um, and wellness awareness uh, today we'll be jumping into mental health and wellness in the climate justice space. And so unpacking the connections between mental health, the environment and climate justice. Um, and we really hope that today's conversation will feed off of a uh, previous discussion and the workshop that happened on Monday. Uh, Trulu, do you want to just give us a little breakdown about what Monday was about for those who are only joining uh, today? Um, and then I'll, I'll explain a little bit before maybe um, what we kind of do is we have a back to basic session which takes a topic, breaks it down and rebuilds it uh, with a common shared understanding uh, and following which, um, uh, so that's every Monday, uh, the la every last Monday of each month. And um, then on the Wednesday following that, we have an ACA dialogue, which is where we try to marry and the word marry is such a weird word. So let's say mesh, uh, the kind of lived experience as well as the kind of more academic kind of element. And so we like to bring those realities together. And so we'd like to believe that experience and, um, and, and lived reality can mean more than one thing. It's not just you have to be an academic to be able to talk on a topic. You who has lived a life and has gone on an adventure and a journey yourself can really begin to kind of claim the narrative and, and hold space for conversations and discussions of your own. And so, yeah, just to hear a little bit about how Monday went, and then uh, we'll move into today's discussion and break into who our kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, kind of panelists, but also contributors and and kind of creatives and change makers in their own right. Yes, I like change makers, change makers. Um, and definitely have some creatives. I feel like everyone is creative in their own right. We don't like to believe that we're creative people, but like just the way we go on about life is creative. You know, we have to find creative ways of surviving. Um, so Monday, like Gabriel said, we held our Back to Basics workshop, uh, which happens on every last uh, Monday of every month. And we're basically unpacking because we have this idea at ACA that we first unpack and understand. And then when you understand, we then discuss, right? So what we built on on Monday was understanding what mental health is, what mental wellness is, and what mental being well-being is, and how mental wellness and mental well-being comes together to then form pillars uh, for mental health. And we're just basically unpacking the terms and also recognizing the fact that you know, often when we speak about mental health, we don't speak of social justice issues and how they affect our lives, right? And so as African Climate Alliance this month, we decided that in commemorating Mental Health Awareness Month, which is October, we are then going to bring these two and hope that this is not only something that we do in October, but something that we're going to do beyond October um, and sort of like bring in how the state of the climate and the state of our environment, how does it affect our well-being with the understanding that as people, we are off the environment. And when the environment is experiencing changes, our bodies also experience changes. I mean, even with 
normal environmental changes that are happening you know when you having your seasonal changes for example your body experiences changes and it reacts differently and so how much more than do our bodies that are in tune with the environment react when extreme changes that are absolutely abnormal happening how do our bodies um, react to that how do our mental states react to that and we also unpacked a bit that our mental state obviously because our bodies once again are in tune with themselves so when you're experiencing something in the mental and in the emotional so in experiencing something in the brain and in the heart in the mind and in the heart it will be expressed in your body and in how you're feeling and the fact that we like just generally feeling a lot of lethargy so like this lack of energy and having no motivation is directly connected to the fact that our mental state is in this dire straits because our environment is in dire straits because of climate change and global warming so then we worked a bit more to then understand that we understood that mental wellness or wellness generally refers to these physical aspects that are obviously physical in front of our eyes which are behaviors and actions that we actively take in making sure that we feel good and we feel better and we're in a healthy state right whereas mm -hmm. mental well-being is more of a psychological or mental sort of aspect of our wellness mm -hmm. as people so these feelings of mental well-being are expressed in the things that we're feeling mentally or psychologically and in the things that we're feeling emotionally right mm -hmm. and these are obvious mental aspects of our lives so just generally feeling down feeling sad feeling under the weather i like using that because the weather is horrible so we're feeling under it you know so just generally feeling under the weather not feeling good um and then getting to the extremes like then having a clinical clinical diagnosis of anxiety or mm. a clinical diagnosis of a depression and more right and then we looked at mm. how do these then affect us as individuals and understanding that as individuals we come from communities mm. right so we understood that well as young people we are most likely to be affected because of the things we are sort of exposed to like social media that is a lot of information on social media that we're exposed to so we are most likely to feel eco anxiety because we're seeing everything that is depressing that is happening around the world i remember one of the fridays i was talking to gabriel and i was like the news are depressing like i had to watch them once a week now i remember like, you even came up to me and you said you said gabe i'm overwhelmed look at what's going on um he like the world's falling apart because of climate change. It's a war. If it's not war, it's corruption. That's huh. going on. And we constantly have this, you know, constant information overload. And we then fall prey to something called doom scrolling, right? You go into your TikTok, you go into Instagram. One thing I hate about Instagram, you go onto Instagram, you forget why you went onto Instagram, you close Instagram. And then a minute later, you get on Instagram. You go back on it and again. <laughs> Exactly. So then we fall prey to doom scrolling. And the fact that there's algorithms now because of data mining that then feed you the same type of information, it is only normal that we like, you know, get some sort of overload. So then how do we deal with those as communities and as activists who work with these communities? And also understanding the alliance part of climate alliance. You know, and that when we're dealing with communities, it's coming from the community. It has to be the community that says, we are depressed and we mm. want to work on it this way and this way. And so we, we spoke about building community, yeah. which I'm really sure some of the things that we spoke about in terms of adaptation are going to come from some of our guests that we have here today with us. And we hope to see them yeah. as part of our network <laughs> next time we're having, <laughs> you know, other conversations and so on. But like, yeah, that's what we discussed on Monday. And we're hoping that today awesome. we're going to build on what was unpacked so that we can discuss. And I love those questions at the end, Kulu. Thank you so much for the kind of breakdown of, of what Monday was. And for everyone who's like, wait, I didn't get a chance to write down what Kulu said. Don't worry. What they said will be put in a rap post and will be put on social media and distributed um, to everybody involved in the space. And so what I loved about how you ended that is, is what can we do? What is the lived reality? Um, how do we work on it together? Understanding the role that people play in promoting mental wellness and health 
and and a lot more. And I, I think today with our guests and our panelists and our change makers, we'll begin to unpack that conversation and hold space for broader discussion as well. And so without further ado, uh, I will introduce our uh, speakers for today and go from there. And of course, if our speakers do happen to jump in and out of the call, as they come, we'll start working with them. Because I believe in, in, in the same way that we, we don't know exactly how climate change will affect us on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to allow for conversation to emerge naturally as well. And I believe in emergence work being something directly linked to kind of the Afrocentric solution to climate justice, um, as or to climate change, and to its low, its, its linked intersectional issues. And so, without further ado, I will share my screen, and we'll begin to understand who we have with us today. Um, and I'll leave it on the screen a little bit longer, so everyone can have a deep dive into who our panelists are. Um, and so today we are joined, uh, like I said, uh, uh, with uh, three amazing panelists. Vuyokazi uh, Mgentu, um, and Vuyokazi uh, uh, is a writer, performer situated in Cape Town, uh, South Africa, whose praxis, now praxis is the practical and the, it's the theory and the action, it's bringing things into kind of motion, it's learning how to swim online and then jumping into the pool, um, <laughs> whose praxis uses poetry, song, physical theatre, storytelling and ritual to navigate ancestral trauma, confront inequality and inspire healing. Uh, she's an alumna of uh, Bodhikaya um, Artist Residency 2022, where she conceptualized and presented a seminal performance work entitled, or titled rather, Uku Vuka Kuka um, Numklaba, uh, exploring the significance of land in healing. She's a member of the Dai Deng Hub, which was awarded a grant by Africa No Filter to use spoken word, documentary filmmaking, and music to interpret the concerns of ordinary Africans in relation to climate change presented at COP27. And I just want to just name something before we even go any further. It's just, just notice the, the difference in, in channeling, in channeling change making, you know? Just think about it. where do you see someone channel their work and their passion and the need for what we need in South Africa um, in, in such creative ways. And so her story, The Serpent's Handmaiden, was shortlisted uh, for the Share Africa Climate Change Award 2022. Her work has appeared in the Kalahari Review, Hereri, Ibu uh, Journal, Short Sharp Stories, New Contrast, a care review, Pepper Coast Lit, the Culture Review, Erodaram, Erodromen, and elsewhere. So as you can see, this is a multifaceted individual who I hope will hold space for many of the discussions and questions we have to unpack today. So thank you so much, Vuyakazi, um, for joining us today. And we'll give you a moment to jump on just so you can say hi to everybody in a minute. But just so while we're on a row, Mpo Ndaba. Mpo is a social sociologist, a writer and scholar of African environmentalism. Mpo is a PhD candidate in environmental humanities South and South, environmental humanities South, and holds an MA in uh, a sociology um, at, at Wits University and an MPhil in um, environmental humanities South UCT. In 2018, he received the Mail and Guardian 200 Young South Africans Award Environmental Category. Uh, he's an also an Open Society Foundation scholar. His work focuses on blackness, spatial politics, migration, and cities. And so a massive welcome to you, Mpo, and for the contributions and the the energy that I know you'll bring into the space. I, I must say, and I, I, I must say this now, when I when I found out who our panelists were. And I dived, I kind of made a bit of a deep dive. I felt like, ah, to be in the presence. Um, and so I just want to name my appreciation for you, uh, for you all, as well as for uh, Stinka um, Kemunta, Kemunto. Uh, so she's a, a mental health and psychiatric nurse practitioner based in Kenya. And so this is where we start looking at the broader region of uh, the broader continent of Africa, not just in South Africa, and I believe that our panelists today and our change makers today will bring a lot more than just their own 
perspective, but the perspectives of those within their collective. Um, she is also a founder of Threshold of Hope Africa, which is a community-based organization that creates mental health awareness and a prerequisite to stigma eradication through advocacy. Now, stigma eradication. I want to hear you say stigma eradication because when it comes to mental well-being in the African context, I think we cannot overlook the massive stigma that comes alongside it. And we'll talk about what stigma means in a bit as we start having this discussion with our panelists. And so I want to kind of just start with whoever's whoever jumps to the mic first and just firstly a massive thank you for being here today and and i want to just before we actually start ask Pulu and i to demonstrate how i want discussion to flow today and it's something called the rule of two um so for example i'm speaking right now blah 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 and i've stopped speaking Pulu? and i'm speaking blah 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 and I'll hand it over to Wiyokazi, who will also speak, blah, blah, blah. After that, only then can Gabriel... Can I speak again? Mute again. So that's the, the beauty of the rule of two. It allows for discussions when our panel is large, when our room is filled with change makers wanting to inspire difference. And so um, I'm just wanting us to practice that as, as critically as possible today. And then also to use the chat as a channel for us to, to kind of put questions that we may not be able to answer right now, but a parking lot for further discussion as well. A lot of what we talk about today can be discussions on their own, can be think pieces on their own, can be webinars on their own. And so I'm just wanting to name that uh, today for an hour, an hour that we have left with each other, we can only begin to touch the top of the iceberg. Um, but we hope that we can kind of hold space for more discussion and for the richness. I want to name a disclaimer. Neither Kulu and I, despite having experiences with our own mental health, are mental health practitioners. We are simply space holders for discussion, for conversation, and for a deeper understanding so that we may begin to uncover pathways for, for change and for assistance with one another. And so I just wanted to put out that disclaimer there. One thing I like to talk about is the dragon's den, you know, is we've got this dragon. For me, my dragon is all of the traumas that are very scary for me to unpack and talk about. And so today, to make sure that I can be as present and to learn and hear as much as I can, I'm not going to walk into my dragon's den and say, come out, dragons! Because unfortunately, no one in this space here today is prepared to hold my dragons other than myself. But that doesn't mean I should limit how I contribute to this space. And so just wanting to name that this isn't going to be a space where we can, unfortunately, hold space for trauma dumping. Not that that's a bad thing, but we need to acknowledge and hold space for what that looks like in the long run as well. Um, but yeah, so while I saw you jump on camera, don't disappear now. Come on now. Come on now. <laughs> um, uh, wait, who was it that jumped on? I saw someone jump on and then I saw them jump off. That was Tinika. Tinika, ah, I thought so, because I saw trees <laughs> for, yes, go for it. Tinika, would you like to um, just start us off with a bit about yourself, how you got into the work that you're doing, and and how today's topic talks to, just talks to you as an individual, as an, and as a practitioner. Welcome to the space. Um, thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I'm very humbled to be here, and um, I've had a very long day because um, my partner was not doing the prayer so Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but it's a bit. It was a bit choppy, so we're going to turn our cameras off so that we can hear you in your full capacity. Well, uh, my name is Tinka Kimunto. I'm from Kisi, Kenya. Uh, I'm a mental health and psychiatric nurse practitioner here in Kenya. Um, yeah, I'm the founding member of the Shield of Hope Africa, uh, a community-based organization that champions for mental health and its related issues. So first forward, what took me to what I do? 
I, uh, I was an education student at the university when uh, I dropped because of uh, life challenges. So I went to uh, medical school where I opted to do psychiatric nursing. Uh, when I got there is when I realized the gap in mental health space because there was a lot of stigma. Personally, as a psychiatric student, uh, we by then were very stigmatized that you can't even speak to someone because if you if someone sees you they're like are you sure by the time you are done with those patients you will not be sick i'm like do midwives give birth every day do people working in the general ward get sick every day so i'm like mental illness is a disease like any disease so this is where i got my energy from and um it's doing me more justice and it's very fair to me because uh, I love creating hope through action. I love talking to people because I know God has given me a chance to give someone a reason to survive uh, amidst all the challenges because uh, uh, in our age, no one wants to talk about mental health because it looks as a taboo or something. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, for that stinker. So I think the, the the biggest thing that 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 stood out for me, and I I mean, there's many big things, <laughs> is is how you immediately in your kind of intro destigmatize this idea that you can't be compassionate and work with people with mental health issues or with challenges because of that stigma of oh, won't you catch it? Won't you catch it? And I love that that will a midwife be giving birth every day? Comment. I think. We don't think about we don't think about that enough. Is there are practical examples to explain how we can kind of like begin to destigmatize the space? And so, firstly, thank you so much for joining us and for kind of intro us introing us to a little bit more of what I wanted to hear from you already today. I think today's conversation, just by that intro alone, will will prove to be quite quite a powerful one. So, a massive thank you for joining us. Um, if have in the room, Po. Are you are you with us today? And if so, we'd love to hear a little bit about who you are, your story, and how today's topic talks to you. Sorry, Mr. Gabriel. I think I'm having a network challenge. Uh, uh, I don't know what you are saying. Maybe you can say it again. Well, I'm having a network challenge. Not a problem. I'm I'm happy to. I'm happy to, to to repeat what I'm saying, um, but just in in future, uh, uh, please use the chat as we kind of dive into the space here. Uh, so a big part of um, what I'm doing right now is just mentioning uh, who the panelists are, asking them to mention who they are because they know themselves better than I know them. Um, and uh, we've just heard from Stinka now, and so wanting to open a room for um, for um, Mpo, uh, if. He is in the room. Otherwise, in the interim, Vuyakazi, would you like to uh, grace us with with who you are uh, and uh, how you got into the space and the work and the passion that you bring to it as well and the unique take from those in our panel today? Certainly. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join this conversation, by the way. Uh, my greetings to yourself, Gabriel, to Tulumango, to the rest of the panelists and everybody else that has taken time aside from their busy lives to just help us flesh out these issues. My positionality with this issue is from my background as a writer performer who once bored with writing poetry and feeling like uh, the glass ceiling was too clearly visible, ventured into fiction. And as I was trying to figure my way around fiction, I think it is a natural inclination to veer towards speculative fiction in that, okay, I'm bored with realism right now and the kind of boundaries and confines that it imposes on my mind, then speculative fiction Real magical realism and everything related became the next best thing in that I was always trying to project towards what alternative realities would look like and trying to propagate uh, new imaginaries for the kind of world that I'd like to see. And at times when, when frustrated, just 
projecting my discontent in terms of, you know, the dystopian views that we sometimes fall into in terms of what the planet could become if we don't take action. So it's a space that I've comfortably settled in, still trying to work my way around it because I'm a self-taught writer and also writing echo poetry when it feels like you just need a way of compacting these expressions of climate action and everything that we want to propagate in the world. So that's how I came into this and very excited to be a part of this conversation and looking forward to the insights of the fellow, my fellow panelists and our guests. Thank you. A massive thank you for that. And I'd like to latch on to that point of a uh, self-taught writer. I can tell you now, sometimes self-taught writers are the best writers because they don't come from Oh, I learned William Shakespeare told me this. What is what does Ta William know? You know, at the end of the day, it it's it's within. And I think as that progresses, it becomes even more authentic in the storytelling. Because I mean, we all have a story that we can tell. And I believe that we can't, we shouldn't rather limit what is put out into the world of what standards have been set and so a massive thank you for for bringing that kind of alternate um and i say alternate not in a negative connotation but an alternate uh, point of view and experience to the space um yeah and I, I look forward to kind of diving a bit more into into depth and and if if our third panelist is in the room with us um i'm not sure but if you are in the room with us um Mpo, it would be lovely to to hear from you Otherwise, we'll, we'll move on into a bit more of a discussional space. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop it in the chat as we move through today. And uh, as Mpo jumps into the call today or, you know, wherever they may be at the moment, um, hold them into, into space, into mind, um, and and on, ensure that, that they are properly introduced into the discussion uh, uh, as they emerge into the space. And so um, my first question, and I'd, I'd like to just play on exactly what I what I touched on a little bit early on and starting with you, Vuyokazi, is, is this idea of the relation between mental health and climate justice. And climate justice, like Kulu says, not just being the environmental, but being the social, the economic, the environmental, being intersectional. I'd love to hear a little bit about just how you how you channel that through your work beyond what you've initially told us now how do you channel the interconnectedness of not only your positionality but of mental health or and or rather wellness as well not limiting what you have to speak about and its links towards justice the justice element when it comes to kind of the climate justice space i think one of the issues that i'm always trying to contend with as a South African in my fiction is land dispossession, economic exclusion, and the impact of spatial dispossession, be it on our immediate environments and how we live in the townships that we live in, and also on how we conduct ourselves in the world with the, with the scarcity of resources that we have to contend with. So I'm always constantly trying to take those things into account and sort of trying to craft alternate realities that not only accommodate and acknowledge that, but try to rectify that. And also constantly referencing African spirituality in order to get a sense of what this has looked like for our forebearers and what advice or wisdom they can kind of lend us as we try to move forward. So I'm constantly trying to balance that with my climate fiction and trying to make sure that it is as authentically African and in that way relatable as possible by acknowledging the realities that we live under and how different they are to maybe our Western counterparts who write in the same genre. So always having my feet firmly on the ground while still projecting towards, I don't know, the stars, I guess, and being informed about everything. I felt tingled here, and I mean it genuinely, like because I think it's so 
this is the first time I've actually, and I'm, I'll be honest, my first time having a conversation with someone who has explained their work as I stay grounded, I stay rooted. However, I, I don't limit that to the earth. I, I limit that to not just my immediate surroundings, like, oh, I'm standing in front of Kulu, I'm having a conversation with Kulu. I'm <laughs> grounded in things. However, I allow myself to expand and explore. And I think when we talk about climate justice and just in the solution element of climate justice, you know, the, the just times look to the practical solution. What can I fix now? And we don't project forward or up or around. How can we start reimagining? How can we start re-envisioning? And I think the links between mental well-being and mental health and well-being and climate justice need solutions, especially from an Afrocentric perspective, need solutions that aren't just the, cool, how can we deal with the right now in the moment? How do we figure out solutions from the right now? Because unfortunately, the right now is a space built in stigma, is a space that is still mixed and deeply rooted in colonialism. And so I absolutely adore the kind of perspective that you bring into the space with being grounded in the reality of people in every day allowing yourself and the work that you do to expand beyond the everyday because noting that the everyday has its limitations and so i want to just just name that and, and thank that point and and while i'm on that point about where our everyday is with stigma i want to pass the the mic to to stinka and ask as a practitioner as someone who who is is on a day-to-day -day basis in the space and dealing with the space and 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 working with mental health and well-being as as someone in psychiatric kind of like as a psychiatric nurse practitioner how do you and you alluded to it a little bit earlier that's why i was excited how do you kind of bring your work into the links between climate change and mental health or wellness how do you how do you practice your you're not just your work, but the realities that's going on whilst also existing within the stigmas that we face in the world. Thank you so much once more for the good question. Uh, this is a, uh, a very good learning session and I'm glad that a good number has just turned up to learn. Uh, the way I relate my work, uh, as a mental health practitioner and in the climate justice space, number one, I want to make it clear that our mental health and climate change or anything to do with environment is intertwined. So you cannot separate them. You, when we talk about mental health, uh, or uh, well-being in the aspect of well-being we have environment as one that we cannot be talking about mental health without talking about climate change or environmental conservation or something like that financial everything like you must have uh, uh, to be mentally health you have you 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 have to be well in all aspects and then you have to even have a sense of belonging. So when we address the climate justice, it does not only involve the, mit the mitigation of the causes uh, of climate change, but we also talk about policies and resources uh, that are in place to support vulnerable co communities. Uh, this are like uh, the, uh, in this space, we talk about the, um, um in in a new place where they were not born we have the uh, inclusion and diversity I, I like all of them they work together and this can be uh, a very positive if this can bring a positive effect on mental health by reducing the psychological distress associated with climate change you know people when they move from one place to another they are affected before they get adjusted to the climate of that place um Yes. Thank you for that. And I love how you, you made it very clear to us, <laughs> irrefutably clear, that it is not one without the other, but rather that it is connected and that we cannot view it as anything but connected. I mean, imagine imagine pulling yourself and saying, well, today I'm not facing this, I'm not facing this. You know, like, ah, how how can you immediately say, 
that your everyday, like for example, if I said as a brown body, you know, I today I'm going to switch off being a brown body, and I'm going to live life. I can't do that. I so I think in the same way that we can't immediately change our identity factors and our positionality. We've got to acknowledge that there are certain things that are so deeply interconnected that we can't change those either. Um, unless it's the link between climate change and colonialism, because we will break it down. Um, and so um, I'm wanting to just uh, kind of bring one more question in before I open the floor to Tulu to, to kind of lead us into another question uh, for, for the kind of session today, which is just how do you, how do we begin? And this is a, a question that can go to to either you, uh, Vuyokazi, or uh, to Stineka, and maybe you both want to answer it in your own way. But on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you, or how do you believe that we, as a collective in the climate justice movement, can begin to center wellness and the mental health of activists and change makers? I think for too often, we find that, you know, as a change maker or as an activist, our day-to-day -day is just this, it's just this, it's just this, it's just this, it's just this, and we don't have a moment to actually say, how am I doing? So how do you believe we can begin as a climate justice movement, center our wellness and mental health? And I, I maybe you want to just hear, maybe we start We start with you, Stinika. I know you just spoke, but just hearing from you and then moving to Buyakazi and, and, and just kind of seeing where we go from there. Uh, your question kindly. The question is, how can we begin as a climate justice movement centering, uh, how can we begin to center the wellness and mental health of activists and change makers? Uh, we we have uh, major issues to like to put us into that. And number one, uh, because we are all activists and this is what we are focusing on, we should start on education and awareness as the first step. Uh, education and awareness then we move to we move to where we advocate for policy change so that we can have policies that favor this 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 uh issue of climate change and mental health of which i know in most countries especially in africa and even in kenya we we don't we it's it's then that people are coming up with such policies to speak about mental health but for sure those are the spaces that we need so that we can center on the wellness and mental health uh, as activists and then we promote self-care practices it starts with us you cannot give what you don't have so it has to start with us uh, and then uh, even if you're going to talk to someone else they'll feel like you know what uh, this is how I practice and this protects my mental health or this keeps me up to speed so you it has to start from you before you uh, go to tell others. So you make sure you and your team, you are doing good practices on uh, that will promote your mental well-being, right? And then we have, uh, we foster the issue of supporting initiatives in communities. We join other activists. We have learning sessions, uh, like for us in our organization, every like two months we recruit young people uh, who are willing we're willing to study about mental health. It's like a, a one month course. We take them through, they get to learn. And so that when they start advocating, they know what they're talking about. They know exactly what they want and they know how to approach even the people in the community where mental health is very stigmatized. Because I see a case where you see someone, you want to talk about mental health and people be like, I am not sick, so I don't need any conversation about that. You see such people have to change their paradigm. So now the few issues to do with mental health, that's when we can get access and get information to the grassroots level. So it has to start with us. And then we have to address these issues. Like we don't just sit by the bush. We, ad we address them because as Africans, I know most of us, we, we tend to believe that people who have mental illness are bewitched. We, we don't look at the factors that can bring such 
issues. So uh, I think it's right time mm. we stop spiritualizing mental illness uh, and other issues. We start seeking for help because there is help. Yeah. And then we, you see, most people again get mental illness from their workplaces. So we should have that promote mental well being for this stuff. Yes. Mm. So you, uh, as Thank an individual, you. Again, you can engage on self reflection and self care now. Mm. A massive yeah, thank you I for think, that, uh, and and I just want to. Oh, am I still am I still audible? I'm just wanting to make sure. If I'm not, let me fix that quickly. Yes, you are. Kulu, am I audible? Okay, awesome. Uh, it just says my thing is saying I don't have any internet, which is always a fun time. Um, but Tinika, I wanted to say thank you for that because I think what you've done now is you've also shed a bit of light on the individual element of how we can begin to center it, but also spoke about the systemic element, you know, the need to make sure that policy reflects what people are going through. And it more importantly, doesn't just reflect what people are going through, but it it offers, not offers, it, it channels solutions. I'd like to say channel solutions, because I think Policy shouldn't just say, well, people are suffering, the end. It should say people are suffering and this is how we are going to begin to fix it and how we will action it. And so a massive thank you for beginning to kind of say it's 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 more than just modeling a positive kind of well-being practice. It's not only that. It is that, but it's not only that. It's also the deeper systemic need for change. And I'm wanting to just, just highlight that element. And, and as I pass to you, um, uh, Vuyokazi, I just want to ask, just to, to kind of add a different element to kind of your question, uh, because that's how I, I I like to kind of move it is is how do you how do you believe we can center mental health and wellness in the climate justice movement, in activists and in change makers, but through your lens of of art, of creativity, of spiritualism, how do we begin to to view it more than just practicing? Um, practicing what we supposed to, or preaching, practicing what we preach, as well as the kind of deep systemic change. But how do we begin to look at centering mental health, wellness in activists and change makers through your lens? Thank you for that, Gabriel. I think uh, the first, the first point for me would be to look at our languaging around mental illness and mental health issues and to veer towards destigmatization, as Stink has said, in that a lot of what we communicate about mental health tends to be derogatory, tends to incapacitate uh, the sufferer, as it were, as somebody who is something of an invalid and needs to, I don't know, needs to be given consideration outside of what is the norm. Whereas African, I think within our indigenous knowledge systems and, and within our ways of being in the world, we do prize empathy, you know, and interpersonal relationships that are guarded in such a way that we are able to hold space for each other on an individual level and on a communal level. Examples such as when a family is grieving in our communities, it's usually the women mostly, yes, but it's usually the community that comes through and takes care of the bulk of the pragmatic concerns of that household, while it's understood that these people need to tend to their psychological well-being, need to process their grief and everything else. I think within our activism space as well, an awareness of what our strengths are, as well as an awareness of what our needs are at any given moment, that'll allow us to shift and say, okay, if you do not have capacity to handle this particular task, I can take over or so-and-so can take over. And that comes with being aware of how it is that we can share space more than anything and validating the input of every individual and trying to deconstruct the hierarchical view that, for instance, academia has the answers or if it is concerning a Black person, then a Sangoma will have the answers and starts to collectively sort of, uh, she's, what is the word? 
to sort of pull in together and contribute to the resolution of each problem as it comes along and understanding the need for rest when it arises and validating that need and creating space for people to be able to vocalize that I cannot do this. I know it is asked of me. I know it is for the good of the planet. But where I'm at in my life, I don't have the capacity. And knowing that there will be someone ready to take over and trusting that as well, that the bulk of the work does not rest on you solely as an individual, that there is a community of willing and capable people that can do the work as well. So empathy, empathy. I think that's where it's at for me. I love that. And also I feel a bit called out <laughs> um, because, um, I mean, it's so true. Uh, I mean, when, when a tragedy happens, oftentimes the community is in the forefront, but who's there for the community when the community is in the forefront? Um, and then not to name the stigmas that exist within black and brown communities predominantly, but not only. And 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 what that actually does to a person and the generational kind of burdens and traumas that build up over time that you know we end up fighting with and our children will end up fighting with and so I'm just wanting to just just latch on to something before I just check if Mpo is in the room again is is just naming um that importance of you do not have to carry it all and the brave thing the bold thing the actual activist change maker thing is to acknowledge, hey, this this thing that I'm holding, I will drop it if I hold it any longer. You know, there's a there's a a, a Greek a Greek story about this guy it's named Atlas who carries the. Uh, can we please it's mute? There'll be a moment for. There we are. Um, there'll be a moment for us to kind of hear from the from the chat and have questions posed into the space. Um, if you do have any immediate pressing question, please pop it in the chat. Um, what I'm what I'm saying is there's a Greek story, but there's a story I like a lot more about this dung beetle that pushes this ball up and up and up, and as this kind of dung beetle pushes all of this dirt and 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 poo up the mountain, it's this burden of like, well, I'm doing a good thing, I'm creating this thing that I was born to do, but at what point do you realize that the second you stop holding that and you can't hold it anymore, it will roll and fall on you. And so it's 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 being brave enough to say, hey, I can't. But going back to what Stinger said is being able to know when it is that you can't, which is building that foundation of knowledge and understanding. And so I, I'm beginning to see already a, a toolkit for activists, a mental health and wellness toolkit. And I, I don't 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 guys, after this meeting, don't run away too fast. Uh, please know that uh, I will be bullying Trulu, uh, or not bullying, let's say, compassionately pushing uh, Trulu Manko and Michelle to follow up with you so we can create and co-create this resource, this toolkit for mental health and wellness through an Afrocentric lens for the climate justice movement. There it is. Um, but uh, <laughs> before I pass to you, Trulu, to kind of hold uh, for another question or two, I'm wanting just to see, Mpo, are you with us right now? And what, if, if so, wanting to give you space to share just who you are and more and understanding that if you aren't yet, it's probably load shedding that's, that's gotten the best out of you. No, okay. I'm just wanting, I just wanted to open open room in case Mpo was with us. Um, we'll ensure that we we have Mpo's reflections and points into the space as well. And so um, I I just want to just, uh, just lend a, just a, a thought where Mpo may be right now and and just channel the kind of energy and the space that that would have come with with his his contribution to today's conversation. Kulu, I pass to you for 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 a moment, uh, just to hold space as well. I note, I note, I note that we may need a toolkit, but at the risk of being a dang beetle myself, <laughs> because the entire time I'm like, oh, get me being read for film, <laughs> you know. Um, but like we we're doing better, you know, and we recognize that we have to do better for ourselves generally. Twenty twenty five visions, it's fine, Kulu. Don't worry. Twenty twenty five visions. <laughs> twenty five vision, yes, vision twenty twenty five. I'm all for that, you know. Uh, but like just generally holding, you know, space for 
ourselves and knowing like you know our thresholds really as people that I have capacity right now I can do this and I don't have capacity right now and I can't do this and understanding that it won't all just fall apart you know when you're not there holding space and understanding that there's other people who are there to hold space just as well as you able to um you know so it this this has been like such a you know type of conversation I'm just like yeah you know smiling all the way through snapping all the way through because I'm just like this is so amazing people are doing great work um especially when it comes to mental health um I deem that to be very important the work that we do itself is very taxing mentally when you're a person that cares about anything that is bound to be taxing uh, for you but I, I just want to note the fact that we have people who are healers in their own right right even beyond uh you know the denotation of what it is to be a healer for stinka being uh a, a psychiatric protectioner and uvuyokazi being uh a healer right but like in their work they doing healing work just generally uvuyokazi in their writing and in their activism i know that they've held you know spaces for sort of inter environmental human sort of type of healing um in different townships around Cape Town. So I just want to then bring it back to the question of nature or our environment and us being able to use our environment as a wellness clinic. Uh you know because I know as as Africans generally for years on years ever since we've started to exist, you know, um uh, we've used nature as our clinic whether it's for our mental wellness or for our physical wellness um you know i know that ufuyo guys is a person that is gifted in being able to spot what kind of plants um you know are good for your body that can heal what you know those kinds of things you know and with stinker doing the sort of work that they doing and i feel it is once again a marrying you know of the traditional and sort of the modern western um uh, type of thing but like in both those spheres and where you stand both as healers in your activist work and in the ways that you are gifted as a healer how are you able to then use the environment and nature as a wellness clinic uh whichever one between the two of you can go first I'll start very briefly then, if possible. I think the first thing for me is usually an observation of nature and her patterns and rhythms, and also understanding again that there is a time for rest and respite, and there is a time when you are and you are capable of operating at your optimal and knowing how to differentiate between the two, just like nature has seasons just like animals in nature will hibernate in winter and reawaken when it's time again understanding that those seasons and those patterns apply to us as human beings as individual as much as they do to community would be my first point of observation uh, observing water and how it's constantly in motion constantly flowing uh at peace when it needs to be but can be very volatile and destructive when it when when it's called upon to be and also understanding that we can somehow uh alternate between those two states within our activism as well that there are times when it does bode well for us to be more passive and more reflective in our way of doing things. And there are times when we're simply called upon to action and to take up arms. And knowing how to negotiate for yourself as an individual, I think is how we'll get through most of what I term the climate fatigue that we experience when constantly inundated with social media, with the news and everything that tells us exactly what's going wrong with the planet. And also understanding that nature 
uh, is naturally regenerative, that some of the chaos that we're experiencing, if we are to believe in predestination, as African spirituality tends to favor, then there's a chance that some of it is premeditated, that the beyond does have a solution, even when it's not foreseeable for us, and taking comfort and solace in that. I think, yeah, I'll leave room for Stinker to weigh in. Ah, uh, maybe to bring me up to speed. Um, please pardon the question. Um, so I was asking that, uh, in your capacity as a healer, so for you as a mental health and psychiatric nurse practitioner, how do you then harness nature and the environment as a wellness clinic? Um, from uh, from our practice in the fundamentals of nursing, we have one of the founders of nursing came up with a theory where patients, uh, there was this thing of uh, this issue of uh, uh, putting them in a very healthy environment. And when I say healthy environment, I, I want to believe that all of us know what it is. And uh, she realized for the theory to be successful, to be studied in school today, she, she Rosea Oriam confirmed that nature promotes healing in, a, uh, in very many ways. Number one, for example, let's say we have a psychiatric patient and we have taken them to a place that is not ideal, a place that cannot promote healing, they will not recover. Even if they recover relapse cases to the hospital from time to time, uh, and, you, and I want to believe that all of us know how exhausting uh, treating mental illness can be, especially when um, there is a lot of relapse, uh, admissions are so many, so this patient has to come back and forth to the hospital. So, number one, uh, nature promotes healing. When uh, when the climate is fair, like fair to all of us, we we, we don't normally see uh, the especially the psych or marginalized community getting distressed. But once uh, there is issue of climate change, especially now that we are experiencing a lot of rains, especially in Kenya, we, we we find that these people get depression, anxiety, and then there's this issue of natural disasters, food insecurity, you know, all this will trouble someone. And now, even if they are put in, uh, if, 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 when they are in this environment, they cannot heal, but now when they are taken out of this and or they are thought on how to be resilient on this issue and how to approach such issues when they come forth, they'll be able to pull through without much distress, although it will take time to adjust. Back to you. Yeah, When I tell you, oh, look, turn the camera on. I need to look at somebody. Mm. Mm. The healing that I'm feeling already, just in the, just in the understanding that there are solutions and that those solutions do not have to be looked for too far. You know, and I, and and I, my mind hearing it's almost like a validation of what I thought I might have known. You know, I always felt peace when I would walk. You know, and I always felt peace when I would visit the ocean. And understanding that that's not just, just oh, you're just walking and that's what it is. But understanding that deep spiritual connection that they, that that there lies within. Understanding that actual psychological kind of healing and. And, and much like the ocean, ebbing and flowing over a rock, smoothing out those traumas, those injustices, those pains, 
just just wanting to hold space and and to prompt the importance of what was just said. I I pass back to you. Hmm. I mean, uh, yo, that that was that was so powerful. That was really powerful, and I often think about the inaccessibility of mental health. You know. Um, in Africa generally, particularly for black and brown people. You know, it's not something that's easy, easily accessible. And for example, with our mental health care in South Africa, you're told that well, you can just walk into any hospital and there should be a mental health practitioner to help you. But you struggle. I remember like I struggled for a whole five months just to get an appointment type of thing, you know. So when we starting to think of adaptation strategies, whilst we try to hold government accountable and we try to hold the system accountable in saying that this is a service that you should be providing, provision, not access, provision. This is a service that you should be providing. But at the same time, we like slowly trying to find ways to adapt that don't require of us to have money in that sense. That we know that when I'm not feeling well, I can just take a walk. And taking it in, you know, the healing properties of nature, the healing properties of our environment, you know, just being in our own environing spaces and knowing that I can start with my healing here. Yes, I need help beyond this because it is not the be all and all. I need help beyond this, but it starts here. This is empowering in the sense that communities are also then, you know, Sometimes you feel so helpless. You feel so helpless. You can't do anything about anything. But once you start realizing that there's a bit that I can do for myself and a bit that we can do together as a family, as a community, in holding space for ourselves and holding spaces of bravery, of courage, and of wellness and well-being for ourselves, where we prioritize our mental health and we prioritize, prioritize our physical health and we do that through God-given nature, God-given environment, you know, universe-given things that are not meant to be commodified, you know. And this is a conversation that we also had about, like, access to spaces for Black and brown people. These spaces that we know are generally natural. I remember a conversation that Vyogazi had started on Facebook a while back. I think it was like a year or two ago on how she was picking a plant and doing it quite correctly because she has the know-how of how to pick plants without making, you know, like hurting the plant and making sure that there will be regrowth and regeneration and all of that. And there was this lady who just assumed that she doesn't know, know what she's doing and just went on at her. And that speaks to the fact that even when we get access to the spaces and when we get access to that wellness clinic that is nature and that is the environment there's still prejudices and there's still stereotypes that we faced with as black and brown people and a lot of these border and go beyond racism in the context of you know post-colonial africa so that was like really powerful in understanding how we can harness our own energies and how we can harness the environment around us without spending a single cent because wellness shouldn't be a thing that is commodified. Wellness shouldn't be a thing that costs you money. It is important that you're able to live and live a healthful life as a person without having to spend a single cent. And it has been commodified so much that now it is necessary that you have medical aid. Otherwise, you're left in the lurch and those kinds of things. So I just want to, you know, sort of bring it back in terms of us now as the people in trying to harness systems that already exist. You know, we live in countries that have healthcare systems. Um, we live in countries that have education systems where they prioritize teaching you about STIs and not even in the correct way. They like spam you and scare you that you will become like this. <laughs> we don't speak about mental health. So how do we balance you know, and harness the systems and make sure that as activists in the mental health and in the social justice um, realm, we penetrate into those and make sure that 
we harness them for policy changes and not only just policy changes, but to actually see those policies being implemented in meaningful ways, in life-changing ways, and that we see them reflected when you're walking down your area in the township or you're walking down your village and you see it reflected in how people are feeling and in how people are looking. So how do we try and harness those systems uh, going forward? That is my last question for the two of you. And then after that, I hand back to Gabriel. Vuyo Gazi can go first. Awesome. I was about to say, please, please prompt somebody to go first, Vuyo Gazi. Let me try. So historically, what that has always looked like for our communities is that our mothers would be working in the kitchens of the madams, our fathers in the gardens, children at school, and it would only be on Sundays that we sort of find a sense of reprieve in the form of the church where we're able to express our joint discontent as well as our aspirations as a people for better. So I'd say transposing that we have that within our indigenous systems as well, where we have intrombe and spaces of ceremony, where within the communal gathering and particularly within umkenzo, like the dancing part thereof. There's a sense of moving in unison, a sense of alignment and a sense of sympathetic resonance where we're all expressing the same rhythm at the same time in order to kind of come at some kind of consensus as to this is where we're at and this is where we aspire to be at. A transposition of that for me looks like regular check-ins. They don't have to be physical. They could be online like this, where we ask Gabriel, you do such an amazing job of holding space for everyone and of amplifying everyone's voices. Uh, how are you feeling? Can we check in with your throat chakra? Like, are there any, are there any expressions maybe that you feel you've had to hold back in this allowing of space, in this uh, amplifying the voices of others. What's going on with you individually? I think we euphemize the importance of that, especially as activism, especially as people who are naturally inclined to want to hold space for other people. There's little accountability with the self in terms of how depleted am I? Can I afford to take on this much? So if we create systems where we check in with each other, where we hold each other accountable, where you need to rest, for the next two weeks, it is fine. I will take over this particular task because you're dealing with A, B, and C. Um, I think that would be the way forward for us. And also remembering that these things have been around since, you know, times pre-ancient that there are epigenetic traumas as well that we're processing, that this residual trauma from our environment and our neighbors, how then do we unpack that in safe environments where we feel empowered to language these things, where we can start coming up with some kind of praxis in terms of unpacking them in very pragmatic ways, where I can call on ooh, stinker and say, sis, I'm struggling with this on a, psycholog on a psychological level. What, what context can you provide me for this? And I can juxtapose that against what Isindu tells me is going on with me and find some kind of diagnosis that embraces all these knowledge systems and decentralizes knowledge away from the institution and all these festivals of power that impose these perspectives that little consider, if not distort who we are as a people. I talk a lot. I'm going to bow out now, but I'm saying it's within holding hands as a community and it's within, I'm working with the mental image of a potluck where you bring your onion, I'll bring my carrot, you bring your potato and together we cook this soup. So more of that for us, I think. And thank you. Beautiful, beautiful stinker. Um, are you still with us? How can we harness uh, the systems that already exist and policies that exist and possibly creation of new policies to make sure that they're implemented in meaningful ways? 
uh, for people that translate in how we see people and how they're feeling and how they're looking and their health. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, than learn and relearn. So if you want to get this discussion without a deck home, then you are not serious. Um, on the issue of harnessing existing systems and policies to create a meaningful and positive change, uh, number one, uh, we have to do this thing called advocacy and awareness. And these things are just the same because uh, they are the same like the ones that we've talked about. So number one, we have to do this advocacy and awareness. The, the one like we are doing now, uh, awareness about the issues that are, are, are to be addressed, the people informed and they get to know what is happening, how they can deal with what's happening, where to seek for help and how to get help and how which are the connections to tap into so that we can get this help that we need. Uh, and this will involve the uh, policy makers, community leaders, uh, the public to support for the change of systems so that we can change. Uh, and for this advocacy to be successful, people need to be informed and then people need to change their paradigms again, I can see, so that they can be able to see, like they can be able to change their mind when they're being talked to about this issue of climate change and mental health. Because uh, most people, Oh, uh, say like, you know what, me, I, I'm like that. In Swahili, they say, me na kuanga ivo. You kuanga ivo what? Um, be, be open to learning. And I, I find I find it serious that most people are not open to change. They don't know that change is a sign of growth, so they fear change. So they don't want to learn new things. They don't want to engage in new things because they feel like they don't want to move from their comfort zone. But I know through this advocacy and raising awareness, we'll be able to achieve that. And then we have uh, collaboration and partnerships. Um, I want to thank uh, African Climate Alliance because this we are doing is collaboration. Mm, we, we need to bring uh, 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 on board different, uh, uh, and then the department should not be disturbed you on board. Have people from different uh, backgrounds, different people uh, together on this table. I lost you guys. No, no, we, we heard you say we heard you say different people, different backgrounds coming to the table. That's where we lost you. Just on the like bring, bring different backgrounds well, and different people. So you when, continue from there. When we, well, yes, thank you so much. When we put all these different stakeholders on board to discuss these issues. They will be, they'll feel involved in the, they don't want to work towards bringing this change. Because number one, let for example, let's say we are talking about uh, gender-based violence, or let's say we are talking about mental health, uh, gender-based violence, number one. And we tend to know that like most of these cases, uh, they are done, uh, most, most, oh, sorry, sorry. My network is bad, that's what I think. No, no, no. Confirm. Okay, you can keep going. If you can hear me, kindly confirm. Okay, I can confirm. Yeah, so uh, if we put all these people on board, we'll be able to achieve. But 
if, let's say we are talking about mental health uh, policies and whatever, and then you are not involving, uh, you're not involving the uh, people who are affected by, by mental illness, for example, people with lived experience. You need to involve them because uh, for, for them, for this period that maybe they've been on medication, they have seen the challenges, they'll be able to contribute highly on on this discussion because they're talking from even help in breaking the stigma so that we can be able to access to access the justice on this department, the justice that we need. And then we need, um, uh, of course, re research needs to be done by different professionals, uh, especially in the side of health, to be able to wow. reach to the point that we need to get. And then we need to engage the, the people to participate in such like these forums, because I want to believe there's a feedback form that will be there for people to fill so that they can say maybe the weaknesses, the strengths of the meeting, their takeaway, so that you'll be able to know that, you know what, something was delivered today, it was not like a joy riding meeting. So um, we need to engage people, let them participate so that you can know if they if they understood uh, most others have questions and i know others cannot ask here but they still have questions so we should have a forum where these people participate and then we have um, of course the legislation and regulation we need to work closely with the mm. the legislators because these are the people who will go to parliament to represent you so that they can make laws and pass them. So if we don't work with them, this these bills that we want cannot get to parliament or the state or the senate or something so that they can be passed as laws and they can be put into practice and be effective. Yes, mm. so uh, we need the trainings, the educational trainings, like the ones I mentioned. Train mm. people. And get I think, back from them, like train them. Yeah, and I think that you, just you can hear and, me. And, and I can hear you, yes, but I, I'm just also I'm noticing time and and wanting to kind of like like just link on to one thing that you've said there. Um, is is just the beauty of not only just training you and me and everyone in this meeting, but training the 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 legislators as well to understand how to engage with people in ways that are not extractive. Because I think when we deal with mental health, we need to understand that to go up to someone who has experienced a deep trauma and to harvest from them is not something that yeah. we should be doing, but rather having those discussions. And so I love it because that's actually, you're saying, wow, but Mara, that's what you said. You've said that I'm just surmising it into something different. That's exactly what you've said is that having the lived experience. Let's think of what you've said there is, that lived experience being so crucial to, to redefining legislation that protects people and that safeguards them and that guides the way that we develop a future where mental health, wellness, and climate justice ah, are like this. And that we are building a future where justice for all is deeply rooted. And so I'm wanting to just to just say a massive thank you. And, 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 and I'm, I note that there are questions in the chat, but as Trulu has put, please email education at AfricanClimateAlliance.org if you have any questions that you'd like to add to the space. And we'll ensure that it goes to Stinga and it goes to Vuyakazi. And we'll also make sure that we reach out um, not only to the two of those panelists, or oh, panelists, but people who have been holding space for us today, but we'll also make sure that we reach out to Mpo and see if we can get his perspective into the space. And so I'm wanting just to name that this is not the end. It's simply the beginning. Understanding, having conversations. Where, as you said, hey, I speak a lot, but guess what? It's those who speak a lot that open doors for others to begin the conversation. And so don't, don't hold yourself back in that element, but just naming that, naming that thanks. And, and I think I speak on behalf of, of Tulu as well as the room. 
a massive thank you to our to our speakers today, to Vuya Kazi, to Stinka, for your perspective, not only on the questions, but on the broader understanding of the topic today. I think I was so eager to jump into today's, in today's call because the topic of unpacking the connections, the word connection is what got me because it's not just connections between mental health and climate change and wellness. It's connections between you and me and how we begin to define what that just future looks like. So the data reimbursement form, uh, for those who want to stay connected in our next session, uh, will be reshared now. I'll pop it in the chat again. I know Tulumanko has already done so. Please understand, we uh, will close the form. So no form will be accessed after two days. It will take a week to process the, a week at most to process the reimbursements. Now that our, the site that we use, Ding, is up and running again. We thank you for holding space for us in that time where our, our access to sending data and access for you to be able to connect to our workshops wasn't working. It's never our intention to exclude uh, you from those spaces, to hold you out of these spaces. But obviously, life holds us back from being able to action pathways for you to engage. But it's back up and running, so please engage there. Um, future learnings will come out of the space. More communication will follow today's workshop through the education at AfricanClimateAlliance.org um, email, as well as through our social media. You can just search African Climate Alliance all across the different platforms, except for TikTok. But I have a little rumor, little rumor that that's coming up eventually. So a massive thank you once again to Vuyakazi, to Stinka, and Kulu. A massive thank you to you for holding space with me today. Uh, would you like to say a last word, Kulu, before we bring the room to a close? Thank you so much, Gabriel. For those that are in Cape Town on the 11th of November, we will be holding an in-person workshop and it will be held at the Solidarity Center, which is the AIDC offices and observatory, but you will see posters on it soon. And please register if you are in Cape Town. And just once again to say thank you, Nkoska Kulu Vyogazi for joining us today. Asante Sana Stinka for joining us today. Thank you so much. This has been such a fruitful conversation, you know. A part of me was very excited for it, but also at the same time dreading it because, you know, conversations around mental health, you know, because you don't want to be harvesting and harvesting from people, but also trying to understand, you know, because I'm very proud of the alliance part of African Climate Alliance and understanding that we must collaborate and we must show solidarity with activists who are working individually and also with activists who are working in organizations across the continent because we try to bring, you know, that sort of very pan-Africanist, you know, lens and very intersectional lens in our quest for justice. And you two today have proven, you know, this is one of the sessions I'm proudest of, like, I only say this every month, but <laughs> I am proud <laughs> once again. I am really proud of this session. And I'm really mm. grateful that both of you were here today. And course, Siabulela and Asante Sana. Thank you so much. A massive thank you once again to all. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening, afternoon, morning, wherever you may be in the world. And know that there are collaborations, networks, and connections that will hold us strong in our fight for justice. Enjoy your evening.